Okay, everyone. We're back. Yeah. Some of you may have noticed the sound of a child's laughter in the hallways or a TCG staffer pushing a stroller or a father with his young son making visits with us on Capitol Hill. For the last three years, TCG's conference has been family friendly. And it's, yeah, and it's so much fun to meet all the children, the nieces and nephews who are here at the conference with all of you. This is also the legacy of our time in San Diego. While there is something from every conference that stays in our host community, there are also things that leave with us, and that's one of them. Um, a legacy from this year is an increased global connectivity, a sense that as theater makers, we can work toward building our own theater nation that transcends cultural borders and political borders to create shared spaces for theater making and for examining global issues we can help solve together. Over the past year, TCG and the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown University has developed the Global Theater Initiative. By combining the unique reach of TCG's international programming with the lab's distinctive experience in humanizing global politics through the power of performance, GTI strengthens, nurtures, and promotes global citizenship and international collaboration in the theater field. It also honors and intersects with the work so many theater colleagues have already invested in cross-cultural exchange and understanding. This week, we held our first major project together, a global theater pre-conference. And to tell us more about it, I'd like to introduce DC host committee member, Derek Goldman, co-founder of The Lab and our partner in the Global Theater Initiative. Thank you, and thanks, Teresa. Um, I've been coming to TCG conferences for over 20 years, first as a daunted, fresh out of college newbie who had founded a small Chicago theater company that had joined TCG, where I remember well the sensation of feeling like person after person would take a furtive glance at the name tag and move right on. <laughs> And equally as strong, I also remember the sensation of being welcomed into circles I felt far too young and clueless to be in, and being treated like a peer by people I revered and would come to revere. For the past few days, as never before, this theater nation has felt like the nation I want to live in. In my 11 years living in Washington, DC, this is the most proud I have felt of our community locally, nationally, globally, and its capacity for radical hospitality and for galvanizing action. We've gathered against a wildly eventful, tumultuous backdrop of Brexit and crashing global markets, the Supreme Court ruling blocking Obama's immigration plan, vital sit-ins on gun laws at the Capitol, and then panning the camera out as Georgetown School of Foreign Service Dean Joel Hellman reminded us at our Wednesday pre-conference. According to the last reports from UNHCR, 65 million people are being faced with the travails of forced migration as a result of conflict, violence, and deprivation, the highest number ever recorded by UNHCR. The theater nation I have encountered here is a nation that is not in pursuit of nationalism or any other kind of isms or schisms that instead of building walls, seeks to foster genuine human exchange, empathy, collaboration, and relationship building across differences. Those who would build walls have always understood the power of silencing artists, of nipping culture in the bud. At GTI's global pre-conference on finding home, migration, exile, and belonging at Georgetown, we hosted artists and thinkers from 25 countries almost all of whom have stayed and participated in our conference. Profound thanks to these friends for making the long journeys and to you who've offered them hospitality, fellowship, have been hosts in the fullest sense of the word. There's inspiration to be taken from our guests. Many of them have spoken of their experiences facing down danger, repression, and violence in their own countries and how they have found it essential to continue to make their art amidst mortal dangers. 
Our friend, UNESCO Artist for Peace, Ali Mahdi, arrived today from the Sudan and has been doing this works, work in camps in the Darfur region with war orphans and perpetrators for many years, using theater to do large-scale healing and to imagine a new future. As Teresa mentioned, our Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown was formed to harness the power of performance to humanize global politics, something so many in this room are already doing. I'm thrilled by this partnership with TCG, these first few steps that the Globe, Global Theater Initiative is taking toward that future, and I'm grateful to have really wonderful collaborators on that journey. A special thank you to Teresa, to Amelia Cachapero, and Kevin Bitterman at TCG, to my wonderful lab colleagues, Ambassador Cynthia Schneider, and the amazing Jojo Roof. And whether you're a peer I revere or a peer I've yet to meet, if you're interested in the Global Theater Initiative, I hope you'll reach out to us and get involved. I look very much forward to what our theater nation can achieve together. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. We're so excited for this collaboration and for all the work that you do and Jojo does and Cynthia Schneider does into making the global pre-conference such a success. It's now my pleasure to introduce our presenter of the TCG Theater Practitioner Award. Susan Hilferty has designed over 300 productions across the globe, receiving multiple Tony and Drama Desk Awards, as well as an Obie Award for Sustained Achievement. In addition, she chairs the Department of Design for Stage and Film at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts. Please join me in welcoming Susan Hilferty to the stage. I'm so excited to be here today, to see all of you, to be part of this conference, um, but also for this special moment. Because um, we're here at this moment to celebrate the mythic spirit that is Michael Kahn. Artistic leader, educator, artist, mentor, colleague, and friend. Michael has been an influence in the American theater for so long that I'm sure that even he is astonished. <laughs> His vitality as a force in the arts in this country only continues to grow. Michael's contributions have been extraordinary. The list of his accomplishments is too long to read. But for me, his most impressive talent has been his nurturing generations of theater artists. I believe a great leader recognizes and acts on the task of inspiring and encouraging the future leaders of our field. Fearlessly husbanding talent. That's how I see Michael Kahn. Whether it is his leadership at the Juilliard School, guiding an impressive list of actors, or his creation at the Juilliard School of a directing program with Garland Wright and Joanne Acolytis, or the establishment of the Academy of Classical Acting here in DC. Michael has always been a leader in the conservatory education. But it's Michael's role in mentoring individual artists that I'm especially proud to celebrate today. He has supported and encouraged countless artists who have gone on to become influential in their own right in the American theater. I think that there are probably many of you here today. I've known Michael for years, but I've designed twice at the Shakespeare Theater. Experience is separated by 20 years. The first, The Tempest, directed by the late, great Garland Wright, and the second, this past season, Salome, adapted and directed by Yael Faber. I think these two artists helped define the depth of Michael's influence. Garland, who if you don't know, and I can't believe that it's possible that you don't know, but if you don't know, before his passing, Garland was the artistic director of the Guthrie Theater. After blazing a deeply passionate career across the stages of America, Garland's first job, though, in the theater was as assistant director to Michael at the American Shakespeare Festival in Stratford. This relationship nurtured the astonishing talents of Garland and the beginning of his rich career in the theater. Over 40 years after working, first working with Garland, Mark Michael continues his unstoppable, fearless commitment 
to vital, challenging theater that he's always, enc always encouraged by supporting the work of Yael Farber, a South African director, by inviting her to come to DC and share with us her vision. In this case, a radical revisionist version of an ancient narrative in her production of Salome. These two amazing directors bookend Michael Kahn's visionary leadership in the encouragement of new talent. It is Michael's continual recognition and support of developing talent by his many acts of mentorship that has strengthened the community of our theater. The TCG Pract Theater Practitioner Award, the TCG Theater Practitioner Award, recognizes an ind individual whose work in the American theater has evidenced exemplary achievement over time and who has contributed significantly to the development of the larger field. I can think of no one better to deserve this award than Michael Kahn. So Michael, come on up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh my God. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, I'm very moved by all the things you said. Uh, am I stopping somebody's speech now? Okay. <laughs> it's not mine. Um, and, 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 and first of all, Thank you all for coming to DC. You know, this is my home now, and it was great that you're here. There's so many of you, and you've so enlivened just, just the city, and I want to thank you for choosing DC, and thank you for this. I, I'm just going to take a little, uh, I realized in, in these conversations, which have been so exciting, that it, how privileged I had been, uh, how lucky I'd been, but also how privileged I was. Uh, my mother was a Russian uh, immigrant, a working mother, but, um, she taught me to read at a very early age, and when she would come home from work, the, the bedtime stories were Shakespeare and the Bible. <laughs> uh, she didn't think there were any kind of dirty jokes in Shakespeare, so she, so she didn't cut anything out. She knew there were in the Bible, so she cut out Song of Solomon, but... <laughs> but later on, when I did Shakespeare, I realized how many dirty jokes she actually read to me. Uh, then, I was luck then I went to a school where uh, I told them at a very early age that I wanted to be a director in the theater at the age of six, and, uh, which only meant I was a terribly bossy child. And, uh, and, and they said, okay, in the second grade, you can go off and write a play and direct it uh, about any subject you want. And I said, I will do the Pony Express. And, and I wrote a play about the Pony Express and directed it, and nobody ever ever in that school, in that faculty, ever said to me, what an idiot you are, Michael. You've just taken the Pony Express to London and Paris. That was totally impossible. <laughs> but they said they didn't stop my imagination and they didn't stop my creativity, even though I didn't know either of those things, what they meant at the time. Then I went to college and I went to Columbia and, 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 I, and I crossed the street to Barnard because they said, what would you like to direct? And I said, I would like to direct Pericles and Pear Gint. <laughs> uh, I didn't know a whole lot then, but I did know I wanted to do those two plays. And, and they let me. And I realized when I was doing those plays that I wanted to do, I loved doing complicated, ambiguous, I knew what those words meant by that time, uh, difficult material. And I was born in New York, and I used to go to Broadway shows all the time. So I was it's, at college. I was walking down Broadway, and I, I was looking at you know what was going to be my life, and I was looking at all the uh, marquees, and I I realized I didn't want to do any of those plays, except for the one Tennessee Williams play that was running, and I thought I don't what do I do? I can't. I don't. I'm not interested in this material. I d where am I going to go? Well, I was living in New York, and it was a wonderful time for, for, as it is now, for new playwrights. It was a golden time, and I think this is now a golden time also. And, and I was able to work at coffee houses, the legendary La Mama. 
I did got to do the new plays of Sam Shepard and Jean-Claude Van Itali and Maria Irene Fortas. And luckily, I met a young writer, Adrienne Kennedy, and I did a play for her, of hers in Edward Albee's class, and, I, and he produced it off-Broadway. And from that, Joe Papp found me and gave me a Shakespeare play. And I thought, this is what I want to do with my life. And as, I, and as I found that, I also realized I would like to be someone like Joe Papp. I would like to have responsibility for my own career, for the work I do. I would also like to have, as he did for me, responsibility of surrounding myself with the most interesting people, the better people than myself, and where could I do that? And luckily, the regional theater movement had started, and TCG was there, and my life began. Uh, and I am, I was lucky to, to be able to follow something that I believed in. Now, this has been a hard year. It, it, why should it just be a hard year for the theater? It's a very hard year for the world. And, uh, and the theater reflects the world, and it, the world changes so fast, and it changes so fast in our own theaters. Uh, these, coming to a TCG conference is a source of inspiration. Not only the fact that there are so many of you with new ideas and have stuck to, stuck to theaters, have brought new life and new ideas into the theater that you're able to share fertly with me, to hear young people talking about how they solve problems is, is always a, a huge, huge inspiration for me. So tomorrow, this is a great moment. Tomorrow the real world starts. And it's a little scary to go back to it because this is a kind of amazing brigadoon, which happens just once a year. But I'm going to take everything with me that I learned today because I still believe that the theater is the place that we can break down walls. We can change people's hearts and we can change people's minds and we can help make our communities a better place. So thank you all very much and thank you for this. Thank you for Charlie. Oh, he's taking your picture. <laughs> Okay. 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 Now, thank you, Michael. Thank you for your artistry and your leadership. Thank you for Michael was really helpful in the organizing of certain parts of the conference. He's been really involved, and um, it's just been wonderful to be here and to work with you, Michael. Um, I'd now like to welcome Rosalind Barber to the stage to give us some context for our closing plenary. Many of you may know Rosalind as the brilliantly multitasking chief of staff at the Public Theater, but we've also gotten to know her as a core participant of our first Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Institute cohort, where we've been lucky enough to witness her commitment to justice firsthand. Please join me in welcoming Rosalind Barber to the stage. I'm going to take this away. Good luck. Hi everyone, my name is Rosalind Barber and I'm the Administrative Chief of Staff at the Public Theater and I have the great privilege of working with Oscar Eustis and Patrick Willingham on the public's government affairs and institutional strategy. And in that role, I've had the great honor of fostering a relationship with the U.S. mission to the United Nations through Ambassador Power and her amazing staff. I graduated from a small Jesuit liberal arts college with a major in theater and minors in political science and philosophy, but I never imagined how I might fuse my passion for social justice with my love of theater. Yet about 18 months ago, I was given that opportunity as I began working with Ambassador Power and her team to bring UN ambassadors to the public theater for performances there. Um, a few months ago, uh, during a visit to the United Nations in New York City, a member of Ambassador Power's staff pointed out to me and my colleagues Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which reads, everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community, to enjoy the arts, and to share in scientific advancement and its benefits. 
I am so honored to work with the amazing staff of the Public Theater, which embodies this right every day with the work on its stages, both downtown at the Delacorte and at the Delacorte in Central Park, and through its programs like the Mobile Unit and Public Works, which seek to create a more equitable and compassionate society. And I'm equally honored to be represented by Ambassador Power, who recognizes the unique power the theater has to shift perspectives and in so doing, change the world. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our closing plenary speakers. Oscar Eustace has served as the artistic director of the Public Theater since 2005. After serving as the artistic director of Trinity Repertory Company in Providence, Rhode Island from 1994 to 2005. Throughout his career, Oscar has been dedicated to the development of new work that speaks to great issues of our time and has worked with countless artists in pursuit of that aim, from Tony Kushner and Susan Laurie Parks to David Henry Huang and Lin-Manuel Miranda. He is currently a professor of dramatic writing and arts and public policy at New York University and has held professorships at UCLA, Middlebury College, and Brown University. Kwame Kwe Arma, OBE, is artistic director of Baltimore Center Stage. He is the former artistic director of the Festival of Black Arts and Culture in Senegal, chancellor of the U University of the Arts London, and former ambassador for trade and Christian aid. In 2012, he was named an officer of the most excellent order by Queen Elizabeth for services to drama. Ambassador Samantha Power is the US, rep U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations and a member of President Obama's cabinet. In her work at the United Nations, Ambassador Power has worked to promote and defend universal values and human rights. She has become known for the innovative ways she uses New York City's vast cultural resources, especially the theater, in her diplomacy with UN leaders. Prior to her current role, Ambassador Power served in the White House as at the National Security Council. Before joining the US government, Ambassador Power taught at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government and was the founding executive director at, of the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning author who began her career as a journalist reporting from conflict zones across the world. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. So good afternoon, everyone. Excellent. Um, my role uh, today really is just to facilitate these two rather brilliant minds talking about issues that, that, that mean things to us. And uh, in a week where my country, or my home country, sent out a, a terrible signal to the world that could at least, at its least, be interpreted as isolationist, it's wonderful to be at a conference where we're talking about a nation. Um, can I just give a big up? to the British contingent who are as depressed as I am. <laughs> so, cultural diplomacy. Um, I, I mean, I think everybody in this room understands it within the context of what we do as theater, as a, you know, as a community. We, you know, we, within the context of race or gender, we are one community explaining to the other who we are and what we are and asking for empathy. But, Ambassador, I'd like to ask you, in, in the context of international diplomacy, um, do you see a role, or, or how do you use theater and the performing arts in that context? Well, I use Oscar to get tickets. Uh, <laughs> and I start from there. No, uh, there, there, uh, one of the biggest surprises to me in um, moving to New York and having the privilege of having this great job um, in representing the United States is how automated things are at the UN and just how rote the talking points are. And sometimes you're in meetings where you really just feel that people have dusted off points and arguments and that they've ceased to, there's not, there's not the same intentionality that there might once have been and they're reading from what their capital has told them to do. 
So my central challenge in getting anything done is how do you bust out of that? And what are the ways to puncture uh, that you know, reflexive, business as usual kind of way of doing, given the state of the world that has been alluded to, um, and which we're all familiar with. So theater has been one incredible vehicle for that. And maybe the best example, I think, is, is LGBT rights, which is totally polarizing within the UN uh, community. With 78 countries have criminalized being gay, a dozen have the death penalty for those who are you know, LGBTI. So how to, how in a million years do you get past that? Um, and we've tried a bunch of different ways, you know, kind of within the confines of the, the negotiating room or of the UN itself. But the, be the best vehicle by far was to take 17 uh, ambassadors to Fun Home, uh, <laughs> right? And exactly. And what we're including uh, ambassadors from Russia, Vietnam, a couple of African countries. And I'm not sure they knew quite what they were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> might, small print might have been a little uh, smaller than, than usual. <laughs> um, but the, you know, the, the thing about any personal story is that life is lived forward, right? And so they, when they watch Ali herself fighting her own identity and just having a crush and kind of not know, knowing what to do with it, wanting to go away and then wanting to go with it. You know, there's no human on earth, I think, who can't identify with that if they are proximate to it, if, if, if they are living it forward rather than living it out of some, you know, textbook or diplomatic cable. And so to watch these ambassadors, initially a little squirmy, some of them, um, and then just fall into the narrative mm. and fall into the uh, to the drama of this individual and her father and what he was going through and so forth. It was just, you could just see a dent. You don't see the world change. It's not a panacea, but it, the, my question always is how do I create a space then to, to come in and try to get something new done? We, in the wake of Orlando, were able uh, to get the UN Security Council, uh, this is two weeks ago, um, to condemn the targeting of people on the basis of sexual orientation for the first time in the 70 year history of the UN. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I can't tell you that there's a straight line between Fun Home and that, but, <laughs> but I can say Fun Home happened. People lived that. They were moved by it. They forgot about what their national position was because they were watching a human story play forward. And then mm -hmm. a few months later, we did get what we got. You never know. So my job is to maximize the, the, the number of again, the, sort of the, 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 the means of piercing the, the architecture and the, and the artifice and the automation you know, that, that the institution, unfortunately, projects. Oscar, uh, the ambassador spoke then about the straight line between creating art and catalyzing debate or even change. And some might say, Hamilton, eclipsed, not just to talk about the plays that you've transferred to what was formerly called the Great White Way, but now feels a little bit more diverse. <laughs> <laughs> um, th this, on Monday, I, I had the pleasure of, of being, you know, uh, part of an event at the Delacorte. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what the impulse was behind this, the swearing in ceremony yeah. that the public facilitated? Mm. Well, um, you know, wouldn't have, won't have escaped your notice that actually Samantha said she couldn't say there was a straight line. And that's, <laughs> I'm assuming that's because she's a diplomat. I will say there's a straight line <laughs> between art. And, and what we did uh, on the 20th, which was World Refugee Day, is we uh, used the Delacorte for one of its most beautiful purposes that we're going to do more, which is a kind of town hall. And in collaboration with the International Rescue Committee, we put on an event called Welcome Home, which was essentially trying to memorialize and celebrate the better angels of American nature and the fact that this is a country that was built by refugees and immigrants. All of the strength and everything that is actually true about American exceptionalism is because we have embraced immigrants and refugees. And we had a... It's true. It's true. It's and um, 
Actually, just a quick sidebar. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, one of the uh, unexpected pleasures of uh, having commercial uh, companies with Hamilton and Eclipse and Fun Home is that uh, we are allowed, as commercial entities, to support whoever we want. You know, all of us know that as nonprofits, we can't advocate for political candidates, right? Well, as commercial enterprises, we can. So I'm happy to say that Hamilton is doing a big fundraiser for Hillary Clinton on July 12th. And who would have thought that by going into the commercial sphere, I would feel a little bit unleashed politically? That's good. Um, and uh, that actually the important thing though with the discussion with the company was really trying to take them through from their position, many of them as Bernie supporters, into this. And the company was wholeheartedly behind it, as I hope that will be a conversation that is repeated around this country over the course of the summer because it is so important in any case. Um, so what we did, the Welcome Home was a beautiful event that had readings and music. Um, Kwame read, uh, did a beautiful job of reading John Winthrop's um, speech aboard the Arbella, um, uh, which includes the famous city on a hill that was misappropriated by our former President Reagan, because it, it really is talking about uh, the way that the way that we are a city on a hill is because we all share, we struggle together, we suffer together as one person, and that's what will make us a nation. Um, and you, were, you did that beautifully, Kwame. The check is in the post, sir. <laughs> Thank you. But no, it's true. And, you know, uh, Kanan sang a couple of beautiful, it was a great event, but the real heart of it was the beginning of it, where we, um, uh, the uh, Secretary of uh, uh, Homeland Security, delivered uh, the oath of citizenship to 19 new Americans from, I believe, 12 countries. And we sat on the Delacorte stage and said, now, this is actually a worthy event for the stage. This is a place where we are literalizing the fact that we are giving center stage over to these people. And there wasn't a dry eye in the house, including mine. It was just astonishingly moving to see, you know, my favorite was, what seemed to be about a 75-year-old woman from Afghanistan taking, taking her oath of citizenship and getting her certificate from the Secretary of uh, Homeland Security. It was just a tremendously powerful event. And it's one of the ways that, and, and it was, again, I hope something will do a lot more, where we can actually take what the theater does, which is put the spotlight on people, give people center stage, and literalize it and say, actually, we can use this place as a way to um, celebrate those who are so often not celebrated. Ambassador, indeed. <laughs> Ambassador, in this environment, of course, everything that Oscar said, you know, I cheer and clap. But within your world, how seriously are the arts taken? How seriously are, are plays and theater and drama? I mean. <laughs> You know, I mean, my batting average in terms of extending invitations to my colleagues, again, in a, not the like-minded, but deliberately trying to do so to a diverse group, um, but is, you know, very, very high. I mean, it, it's, I don't have anybody, you know, turning me away from anything other than some, you know, emergency or something they have to do. I mean, people really want to give it a go. I think, this is why I always say that, uh, you know, Oscar is like my soft power projectile, you know, that this <laughs> partnership is just this, you know, like just to take Hamilton, right, okay, so we, we uh, he enabled us, Rosalind enabled us to take the UN Security Council to Hamilton. Yeah, right, how did I get 15 tickets to Hamilton? This is what I'm talking about, 15. <laughs> but, but so what, what, like what is, okay, they didn't, they didn't even know what they were, like they, they it, it actually enraged me. I was like, you don't understand how valuable this is. <laughs> you don't know what people would give for just, this, just, you know, just, and they're kind of there and they're like, yeah, we're at the context, theater. It's like six weeks into the run at the public, so Hamilton hadn't quite it, well, exploded. Well, so. no, you guys were, you were winding down. It was already, well, it I seemed, it seemed it, it, I, I, I felt the only way I could get one ticket was to do this whole UN Security Council thing. <laughs> A good so I'm like, peace. Please, Oscar, yeah. <laughs> diplomacy, please. Um, 
I guess I uh, shouldn't be disclosing that just yet when I still have. But, uh, but anyway, I got my ticket. They got their ticket. They had no idea what they were. But it was just, you know, the United States ambassador asked. They, you know, I, it's, it's Hamilton. It's about the founders. And I was telling uh, Oscar this the other day. What made it so um, extraordinary is that a lot of countries, of course, within the UN are underdeveloped or they're developing their political systems or they, they actually had advanced political systems. They're regressing. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, That's us, the, the, uh, Chrissy president. The, <laughs> but, but we look, we look, notwithstanding our current political climate, but we look uh, like a fixed enterprise, like an established democracy, like our, our checks and balances are, you know, <laughs> we have so many checks and balances now, uh, given uh, the Supreme Court and given what happens in Congress, like, but, but nonetheless, they see these as developed institutions and they have no, particularly the, the smaller countries who are, you know, like in Sub-Saharan Africa and places, they, the idea that we were once a work in progress, that there were these historical contingencies, um, you know, that these things were c contested and fought for uh, and hard and, you know, the fact that they could see that part of America, it's again, like, it's a little bit akin to the fun home because it's living life again forward rather than the false necessity of where we are now and assuming it was always that way and destined to be that way. So, uh, you know, they came out not only having had an amazing night, totally unappreciative of what had actually been secured for them, uh, <laughs> but they came out with a sense of, you know, we're, we're more, you know, we have more in common than not. Like we're all, for all of us, it's a journey. You know, it's not, we're not, no one's at a destination and that's actually quite recent, all things considered, given how they would feel you know, in looking at our institutions now, it looks like it's, you know, kind of been that way for, for a while. And then, of course, to see uh, the, 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 the founder's story turned on its head with African American and Hispanic and other actors, um, that, that, that the idea that we would be doing that today is also a reflection of the dynamism and the subversion, you know, of you art. You used this beautiful phrase when you were talking to me. You, you said that it made America vulnerable to them. Yeah, it made America and vulnerable. And I loved that thought. Yeah. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it really did. It was, it was just the, again, the, the con that it could go any way. Because they, they feel like we're going, they themselves are going this way and that way. I mean, I'm talking again about countries that are really struggling. More than half the countries in the UN are not democratic, you know. Um, and so many now are dealing with either the influx of displacement or the outpouring of their own citizens, of their people. You know, no one wants to be doing that. But so to go back and to see us, again, in that experimental phase um, where everything's up for grabs was very moving. But they, they I haven't, I, mean, I don't know if it's because I'm the United States asking. Probably a little. But, but I also, uh, it's New York, I think they also, you know, so it may be a little artificial. Uh, in, I mean, but I think in Washington also there's, there's an appetite uh, as well. I think the question is how to get young people and, uh, you know, make sure this passes along. And thinking through, we've been thinking within our own mission, how do we get our younger diplomats mm -hmm. to be doing something other than negotiating resolutions, but getting out and about themselves, you know, bringing their colleagues. It's one thing, again, for the, the sort of established heads of the mission to do something like this. But if you're really going to change hearts and minds generationally, you know, we've got to think about this more ambitiously. Oscar, I, you know, we've worked together a, a number of times, and I've been greatly inspired by your access for all philosophy. Can you talk a little bit about that in terms of nation building, in terms of building a relationship with the boroughs of New York, the, the Delacorte? You, can you talk a little about that? Sure, but the first thing I have to say is it's, that's not my philosophy. That's what Joe Papp started with in 1954, and George Wolfe continued. And the, really the, the most beautiful thing about my job for me is I got to take a job where there was not one iota of air between what I believed and what the theater stood for. So I literally, I mean, I feel like I am completely uh, invested in and identified with that idea. And the idea is essentially a democratic idea because the, the brilliance of what Joe first did was say, Shakespeare should belong to everybody. And, you know, it's something, in fact, it, it's, you know, frankly, I didn't even really know this till a couple of years ago. He was inspired in high school by his English teacher whose name was Eulalia Spence, and she taught him Shakespeare and what got him going. She was a playwright 
in the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, it's, it's extraordinary. There are actually a couple of her plays published, and you know, he never talked about that. I don't even, even know for sure if he knew it, but just the idea of this, of this woman, this artist, coming to fruition in the Harlem Renaissance, and then not having any other place to go, but into the high schools to teach, and then her influence going to this, to Yosel Paparovsky, <laughs> this, it, which is what he was at that time. Just, it, it, it's tremendously moving to me. So Joe figured we need to do Shakespeare for free. Shakespeare needs to belong to everybody. Why? Partly because Shakespeare's great, but partly because for historical reasons, Shakespeare is the key to participation in the culture. Is we all have agreed as an English speaking society that he's our greatest writer. So if you are going to say, I get to have a place at the table when we're talking about culture, you have to own Shakespeare in some way. So he did that, and he did that for 13 years, just that, producing free Shakespeare in the parks and the boroughs. We eventually settled at the Delacorte. But then the brilliant thing he did after that was the founding of the public in 1967. Because what he figured, and I don't know how, where this came from exactly, that it's not enough to simply offer up culture to the people. You actually not have to turn not only the auditorium over to the people, you have to turn the stage over to people. You have to let people make their own history, not just receive the canon, but make the canon. And that's what opening the public theater was about. And so that democratic circle of both making it available, turning the stage over, remaking the canon, has been at the heart of the public certainly since 1967. And it's just my job, it's my job not to change that one bit, not to change anything about that. It's my job just to figure out how can we continue to execute that in our current circumstances with all the radical expansiveness that's implied by that. Because of course the thing I love about that mission, I mean, there's many things I love about it, but one of the things is you can never accomplish it. You're, nev <laughs> you're never done expanding democratic enfranchisement. And like the penumbra around the Bill of Rights, it's something that just keeps growing. And so now the show that you're directing in our public works program is a continuing expression of that, where we're saying, all right, we're going to actually blur the line between amateur and professional. We're actually going to say being an artist is not a binary. You are or aren't an artist. It's actually we're all artists, and we're just on a continuum of some people are really, really experienced and practiced and skilled at it and get to spend their lives doing it, and some of them are doing it for the first time. But it's not a difference of kind. It's just a difference of grade. And so we can put 200 community members up on stage singing and doing Shakespeare, which you're going to direct them so wonderfully. Kwame. Thank you, sir. I'm sure I will. And, but that's all. <laughs> no pressure. Uh, we pledge in front of all these people. <laughs> but, but the thing I love about that is that's still the same idea. It's just figuring out a, a new and um, groundbreaking expression of that idea. And so that's what, that's what we try to do at the public. Samantha, uh, though I'm, I'm, I'm certainly loath to even mention Britain at the moment, but um, we're, we're used to cultural diplomacy. We have the British Council, which is tasked and funded to go out into the world and say, here is Britain, here is Shakespeare, here are many of the things that we define as great, and, um, and we interact with you as a nation through that lens. How serious does the American government take cultural diplomacy? Uh, you guys, you may know better. Uh, I uh, that doesn't that. sound very uh, <laughs> I, I didn't mean to. Auspicious. I, I, I didn't actually mean to throw up a cowboy. I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't speak. I know how seriously President Obama takes it. Mm -hmm. I know that Hamilton was conceived of, you know, for a, uh, you know, casual encounter with Lin Manuel, right? The, or the, you know, I'm sure most people know this by now, but when Hamilton was only one song on the concept album that Lin thought he was creating, the first performance of it was at the White House in front of the president first lady. It's just he 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 said to us the other day that he thought he should get to pick up the Tony that he deserved a share <laughs> of it. Um, so along with his Grammys. Um, but uh, I recommend looking on, uh, on YouTube um, because I think if you want to see uh, the, the power of art and, the, and, the, and the, the piercing that I was talking about earlier and I think was alluded to also in the presentation before ours, um, look at President Obama's face after Lin-Manuel has done his thing. Now we all know Hamilton, of course. There's a hip-hop musical, you know, with all these actors playing the founders and 
but imagine, so you don't know any of that, and you're the president, and you invite this guy, and he decides he's gonna do a rap about Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, and Obama, you know, you could just see him, the, 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 the very beginning, he's like, <laughs> like, and then at the end, he, you know, he just leaps to his feet, and it's on, it at least was, I don't know, with all the rights and the patents and everything now, but it was on YouTube, and it's, it's, it's just, the, it's the magical experience. So I think it, you know, some of it is personal, you know, it's, it's, if you yourself are, you know, interested in the theater and have lived the theater and, uh, or believe in storytelling or believe in narrative, um, you know, you're, you're going to embrace this as, as part of your role and see it as a secret weapon, or not so secret weapon. Samantha, could you, uh, you, you talked to me the other day at, in the Security Council with, with the kids yeah. about the way you use personal stories and testimony actually at the Security Council. And although that's not technically theater, I thought it was yeah. incredibly inspiring. I think I might be uh, losing my, my secret powers here. Okay, that's working again. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. So I mentioned the, the context in which we're trying to talk about Syria or trying to talk about the refugee crisis. Um, we have made an effort every time we're doing a, a, a meeting in the Security Council of some importance uh, to, to, to break through. We, and you know, here our batting average is much lower than you know, the take up on invitations to New York theater or, or the public theater. Uh, in terms of breaking through, but we give ourselves a better chance by bringing individuals literally into the physical institution of the UN Security Council who are speaking from direct experience. And to someone in the theater, it sounds so obvious, you would think this had been done for 70 years at the UN, but kind of crazily it hasn't. So the, the, the best example of this uh, for me was, um, and I've lots because we try it in, in, every, in every context, but during the height of the Ebola crisis, when Tom Frieden, our, our director of the CDC, was showing us internally charts, this was in September 2014, showing us charts that showed that there'd be 1.5 million infections by early 2015 because of the exponential rate of infection. And just after we'd had the uh, Liberian man die in Texas and the nurses get infected and uh, a New York uh, health worker come back and, and get infected where our political leadership, even, even some Democrats, just freaking out, <laughs> to use the diplomatic term. Uh, <laughs> and we staged the first ever, I happen to be the president of the Security Council in the month of September in 2014, and so we staged the first ever emergency meeting of the Security Council on a public health uh, issue because it tends to be peace and security, war and conflict and you know, conflict resolution, that kind of thing, and the social and economic issues tend to be dealt with elsewhere. But this was something that was ravaging these countries. And so we just thought, okay, how do we get away from like the WHO reading the numbers and even as graphic and dramatic as the chart was, how do we humanize this? And so we beamed in, we, we did a video conference into the Security Council, and there's the big mural that you saw on the Security Council um, behind you know, where the President sits and the Secretary General uh, speaks completely covered with this video screen that you know drops down and it's this Liberian health worker not terribly educated you know somebody it, the, the way the Ebola response worked is sanitation and chlorine and is every bit as important as being you know like an epidemiologist or something and this Liberian that MSF uh, Dr. Labordas had had put forward to us and said he'd be your best speaker described what it meant to have no beds for people who had Ebola. And he described a man coming to the gates of the Doctors Without Borders clinic in Monrovia, uh, carrying his daughter, desperate to be able to deliver his daughter to Doctors Without Borders. And he, Jackson, who's now become my friend, but Jackson saying, we can't in the way of the Ebola treatment where she can't sort of pile people up and triple people up. And if you don't have the beds, each of the beds are like a specific unit. And he had to tell a father no. And, and a father just laid his daughter, who was clearly gonna die, at, at the gate of the clinic. And he tells this <laughs> to all of the ambassadors of the UN who are crammed into this first ever historic. And he says, what made it so devastating as a father was to imagine what it was like for the father, but then to leave your daughter. But then also to know that the father was going back to his family and he was gonna infect them all. 
because the way Ebola, he'd been carrying his daughter, like forget about it. And, and, he, and he said, you don't, he, in front of everybody, he said, people, you must understand, if you do not come, we will all be wiped out. And he said that, and it was like, it was like that in the, in the Security Council, you know, just everybody stopped. And I really, I view it as a lot of inflection points. The main inflection point was President Obama deciding to send 3,000 health workers and soldiers into the epi, you know, the eye of the storm and into the center of the epidemic. But the combination of us deciding we were going to act, and then that, where you actually, you turn 192 other ambassadors into advocates for action instead of into sort of messengers of instructions and, you know, people were much more personally at stake. And we've done that on searing chemical weapons, bringing the doctors who actually treat uh, the people who've been afflicted with chlorine when the Assad regime had their chemical weapons taken away. They started using chlorine, you know, household chlorine in w barrel bombs and so forth. And we just, we're not breaking through with, with Russia or with, you know, some of the other uh, countries that just sided with the regime instinctively, regardless of what they did. So we brought the doctors who showed the video, the hand taken video of the kids that they had treated who had just been, you know, had no cuts on them, nothing, just were frozen, you know, like almost um, Pompeii-like by virtue of the chlorine and killed. Um, and from that, out of that, we were able to get an accountability mechanism, uh, you know, to basically hold accountable those people who carry out chlorine attacks. So when you break through and you, you know, again, it doesn't, it doesn't happen every time, but, but you, we have to try unconventional ways to get around the, the same old, same old, because we see in the newspaper what the same old, same old is buying us. Tremendous use of first person narrative. Yeah, it's people's stories and, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna open up for some questions from the floor, if that's all right. Um, I'm just going to, if I may, just stand. I think there's a microphone there and a microphone there. Um, and there's also some roving mics. Is that correct? Am I correct in that? No, evidently not. Um, so <laughs> um, so uh, please, if you have any questions, please do just line up um, in the aisle and, and ask them. I would beg, not that I need to, um, that, uh, that, that the question be a question. Um, <laughs> And with that, I open, to the, I open the floor. And I'll point, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's uh, Adrian Schwarzstein from Spain, from a uh, uh, theater group called Kamchatka, specializing in uh, immigrant, refugee, migrant theater. I have a question for the ambassador, and maybe for all of you. I was uh, really shocked the other day in the pre-conference uh, day, and my question is, why you are afraid of some Syrian refugee in Jordan to get to the United States to talk about theater? Why she didn't got the visa to come here to explain his, uh, her wonderful story? Why? Uh, you're, you're talking about going abroad to save the world, but you close your world to other people to come and share their wonderful experience. This is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and not in any way am I trying to deflect at all. There may be some questions that we may ask like that that Ambassador Park just might not be able to answer specifically. So I just want to put that framework out there. And then, ma'am, please. Okay. Um, I, I know nothing of this case. Um, you know, the, the process of granting, I mean, I'm gonna sound like a total bureaucrat here, but it just takes a little time. <laughs> We've gotta run the security traps. I promise you uh, that it'd be good for no refugees, Syrian or otherwise, if we had an incident. And so I take your point, you know this woman and you're vouching for her, but that's not how our system works. So we just have to run it through the system and um, we have, uh, as you know, not uh, taken a huge number of Syrian refugees up to this point to resettle them, uh, which is a huge issue for us, and we're trying to get the number up uh, to 10,000 by the end of this year, and our overall number of refugees up to 100,000 next year from 85,000 this year. So we're trying to do better 
uh, at achieving both of our obje objectives, which are being a country true to what Oscar has described, true to our values, but also uh, you know, enriching our country with perspectives like the woman I'm sure that you, that you described, while also keeping the American people safe. Our political climate uh, is such that you know, we need to maintain political support for this program. And uh, right now, that has, over the course of the last year, that has been much more challenging than it has been in the entire life of one of the most important programs the United States has ever stood for. So I don't know anything about the specific case. I wish I had known about it. Uh, some of you have Oscar's email. Oscar has my email. Uh, if there's a case, I can, you know, these are the kinds of things if one knows about it. So. Happy to help. But, uh, but, but, but help, helping, just to be clear, means putting people through uh, a, you know, a process where you, in, you, know, you try using the information you have uh, to ensure that they can, they can get a visa. It's not a willy-nilly you know, uh, process. You, it's got to be a good process for the sake of the program as well as for the sake of our, our country's security. And sir, so just to give a little bit of clarity to that, apparently it, she was not denied for this conference. It was for a previous engagement. Good. Question over there. Thank you, Mike, coming to you, ma'am. Um, this, can you, okay, great. Sounded like it was off. Um, this is also a question for the ambassador. Um, you know, you reacted when we laughed about the, um, the, the support of the US government for arts and culture in the US. Um, and, and you may not be able to answer this question, but that's, um, my personal view and probably of many people in this room is that there is a significant lack of funding and support by the US government um, of arts and culture in the US. And I was wondering um, if you had any thoughts um, in your position how you can advocate to your colleagues for more support and value of arts and culture in the US and also what we can do as advocates I mean, I know that many people went to the Hill and met with representatives, but um, what we can do to showcase the value of arts and culture and change the viewpoint of the people in power in the US and the American people to view it as a pillar of society rather than as an entertainment benefit. Um, I am definitely on the farm policy side of the house, so I don't have a huge amount of insight um, uh, into the, the sort of funding picture and what is the Hill and what is you know, uh, the administration. Uh, but I think, so my answer is just that of the citizen, uh, which is that the more personal exposure people have, uh, the better. And so the, the question of how to, the, all institutions are comprised of individuals. Uh, they develop as collectives habits and in the case of arts funding, as I understand it, also from Oscar, you know, just it being way down, uh, steadily down, I guess, over the course of the last uh, two or three decades. Um, and I can imagine that that makes your jobs uh, incredibly hard, and what you do is incredibly important. Um, so the question of, is how to take these collectives and disaggregate them so that people get off their, it's like what I was describing earlier, off their talking points and are living the experience of theater, and you know, I think Hamilton. Not every not every theater director gets to have a Hamilton uh, every year, um, but taking advantage of something like that, that that you know has history lessons in it, as well as uh, you know contemporary political lessons, as well as uh, insights into sociology, and you know the reaction of everybody in the theater is its own sociological. <laughs> study in the making. Um, so to take advantage maybe of some of these large successes as a way of uh, you know, m making the case for, for what lies out there, the, the sort of pearls that lie, lie, lie out there in, in all of your respective theaters. But Oscar, you've been fighting this fight for, for three decades to get this funding. Yeah, if, if I can just say two things. One of the things that we can do is try to make sure that our work matters to try to make sure that we're reaching the people that we say we're supposed to reach and try to demonstrate what I believe is true, that the theater has something to offer to our civic discourse on the largest issues facing our society. There's things that theater can bring to that discussion that are vitally needed. 
uh, Samantha's example of the Security Council and first person testimony, it's we have to make work that actually demonstrates on the face of it that we are reaching the broadest mass of people and that we're reaching them with something that matters. Now, I'm not saying we don't do that, but that is what we can do doubling down on that. The other thing I want to say is also has to do with the immigration question is um, not being a member of the administration. I can say, yeah. uh, <laughs> 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 could we close now? I have a discussion. No, the, <laughs> for coming. No, I can say there, there, there is a huge um, epic-making conflict going on in this country right now, and that conflict has many different faces, uh, but that conflict on some level is between two strands of American history, and one of them is about immigration and openness to the world and refugees and about building a nation for everybody, and one of them is about putting up walls and slamming down borders and trying to recapture a mythical past that never existed when this was a white country. And on, on, the, one hand, uh, on the one hand, what we're seeing um, uh, heading the Republican Party is uh, a, a, a joke, a clown. Uh, on, but on the other hand, it's a representative, as the Britons has just found out, of a very real force in our society. And we have to struggle with that and we have to win. Now, one of the ways we're gonna win is by not simply struggling, by also bringing people over to our side. But this, this is, that's gonna change arts funding, that's gonna change our border policy, it's gonna change a lot of things when we can actually make an America that proudly is standing up for the best of America. And that's, uh, that's about who we elect, and it's about who we support, it's about what their policies are, it's the pressure we bring on those people we, uh, that we elect to follow their most progressive selves. And that's something that we can all do as citizens. I, I have to say, I think I've said before, I profoundly believe in theater as foreign policy. During, um, and again, not being a member of the administration, I think I can say this, during the Bush years, um, America across the world was not necessarily seen in the best light. But yet one would go to the theater and see Jesus hop the A-train, where the heart of America was being displayed. And you would say, oh, that's the nation that I know and that I wish to, to celebrate with. And, and that sense of anti-intellectualism that America seems to be going down at the moment is very dangerous, not just internally, but externally, because actually, we begin to think of America again, and President Obama changed that, but we might begin to think as a nation of idiots, that you go, really, that's what you want? You're going to shut down your border and build walls and close down? And I think our, our role as the theatrical practitioners is to make sure that, as you've said, that the work that we create matters so that when it is exported and when it does travel the world, it represents America's best self. Any questions? Yeah, there's a question there. Thank you. Hello. Thank you guys again for speaking today and for an awesome conference. This is my first one. But I have another question for the ambassador. I think it's really remarkable that you see theater as a tool. And I'm kind of curious about the discovery of that. Was it something that like, when, was it a slow discovery, or one day you were like, Eureka, theater, that's it. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering, like, what your personal journey to using theater as something that can affect change outside of, because all of us, that's like our goal. Mm. But you noticing it and actually using it, I'm, I'm really interested in that discovery. Is that question a tell me about your first time? Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to be cheap, but alas. So, um, I'd say a couple things. Uh, well, actually, if I can respond just a little bit to what was said before while saying that I can't get into politics and, you know, I, the, the elections and all that, we, we don't speak to that. But I, I do, th I think there's a little bit of a risk, particularly given how dark, you know, all of us feel in the wake of Brexit, but of, of not looking at some of, of, of uh, the, 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 the glimmers here and some of the, you know, like, <laughs> we, we did just, you know, have Barack Obama, we'll have just have had Barack Obama 
as president for eight years and we've kind of come to take that for granted. Like that's so obvious that a guy named Obama with the middle name Hussein, like that's so obvious he'd be our president for eight years. You know, we, we have, uh, when it re as it relates to LGBT rights, you know, gone in the sh shortest period of time at the most astonishing pace uh, to a place that none of us thought possible, even just a few years ago. We have universal health care, you know, for Americans, one of the most polarizing issues, again, complicated, imperfect, but different. And um, anyway, there's a lot to be said. And the thing that I found most striking just studying, crunching the data about Brexit is just all the young people just wanted to be European. And so there's this, you know, kind of, you know, very, uh, dispiriting but also kind of uplifting feature of the numbers. Uh, dispiriting insofar as you know, you now have all these young people, some of whom of course didn't vote, saying, duh, uh, uh, if I could only have done it on my smartphone without leaving my apartment, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then others saying we're saddled with this decision that is so not us and our generation and in, you know, sort of, anyway, so just I, I reject a little bit the, the we're this close to being a nation, of, just and, to, to, to and, use and, your, and, your and, phrase. And, and to be frank, yeah. I, I, I don't think that I was yeah. saying that we are this close, yeah. but, but, there's, but it does hang over us. Um, there and, there and are I some think worrying things going on and then the And very, I think you're absolutely things. right, yeah. Ambassador, to say that there are kernels of great hope yeah. out of what road we've traveled thus yeah. far. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah. I think as a challenge to us as theater no, no, makers. I understand, I understand. I mean, no, Thank you. I don't, th I don't think like this day in 2016 is a day that anybody's feeling particularly complacent. So uh, just, again, Thank given, you. given some of the forces that we're, we're confronted with. But I think some of you know, these forces are getting strength in part as a reaction to some of the headway that we are actually making. And so totally. just, just to put that in some. Now, my mother, uh, <laughs> <laughs> my mother who is just the most amazing woman in every respect. So she, she uh, split up with my father. Um, when she went to medical school. Uh, she's Irish, but she went to medical school in England and she would sneak away from medical school and I think it was like 20p or something at the time <laughs> to go uh, and catch the matinee, uh, you know, waiting in line and would just pretty much, it basically between her night shifts in the emergency room, she would just gobble up as much theater as she could while she lived in London. And she, that did, uh, we, she, we emigrated from Ireland to Pittsburgh when I was nine we weren't big into theater there. We weren't, I went to high school in Georgia. We weren't big into theater there, but I would hear these stories about her, you know, and she was a tiny, like a waif of a woman, um, you know, and how she always had to choose between, did she use her money to eat or to go to the theater? <laughs> you know, she's tiny and she always go to the theater. Um, so that was just an appreciation. And then when I was a senior in high school, uh, my then stepfather moved to New York, to Brooklyn and then my mother followed when I went to college and once she was here and now she was a, a physician and you know, she had the resources, forget about it. There's not a show in New York that she hasn't seen and so she just dragged me along and, uh, and just with every single, I mean, she's, she's, she works at Mount Sinai, she's a, a kidney doctor, she's a tremendous athlete, she's, you know, I bring her to the security, down to the Security Council when we're doing something cool, she's an, you know, an omnivore in terms of politics uh, but she's like a movie class in the morning and a squash game in the afternoon and then she's sque I mean, the, she's nuts. And so I'm, I have taken like one small, uh, tiny uh, piece of her, of her passion and I think being in this job and having the privilege of this platform has given me a new, you know, I take what I took from her and now I've lived it and I've seen the effects on people. You know, I've never been a person who brought people into theater, you know, go to the theater, and it was, I'd be moved by the theater, but what, what we've done together with, the, with, with Oscar and, and the public has allowed, I have a, I'm, I've got like the zeal of the convert, you know, what you all probably had, what I heard Michael had, you know, in, in, when he was six years old, uh, you know, I'm having in my 40s watching its effect on those I'm trying to move. So in that sense, I'm m more like what you're, what you're doing as you watch your audiences. Excellent. I have time for one more question, I'm afraid, before we run out of time. I believe you have the microphone, but I'm going to also, I'm going to say that I saw Ari put his hand up 10 minutes ago, so forgive me, I'm going to extend it to two questions. Thank you. 
Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for this conversation. It's really fascinating. Um, I would say it's something I would love to extend in whatever brief answer you, for all three of you. Um, one of the great beauties of these conferences, I think, is that we, giving us a chance to sort of envision a better future and envision uh, an American theater moving forward. Um, and so I would love to hear your thoughts about um, how you see uh, American theater working both as a global citizen, but also recognizing that we're hyper-local, um, and what you feel like are the great things that we are yet to have yet to achieve. Oscar, I've heard you speak about more theater that directly addresses the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But I was just want to. I would love to hear from the three of you what you feel like are the issues, or or even a vision of of what theater can be that uh, does not yet exist, but you you hope to see. Um, I'm. I, 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 have a hard, I would have a hard time answering that question just because I'm, I'm so in my knitting, like I, I, in terms of ISIL and the Russians and, you know, so, so <laughs> <laughs> to be, <laughs> to be like, to have that extra sliver of bandwidth, uh, it just goes to my seven-year-old and my three-year-old and, and uh, so when I leave government, I will, I will come back and I will have a better answer. <laughs> I'd like to think that Samantha actually can't answer that because she's getting everything she needs from the theater from coming to the public. <laughs> that, that must be it. That's it. Um, you know, look, the, the, the thing that I feel particularly passionate about these days is the question of expanding our reach. Um, it still feels to me like we are reaching way, way fewer people, a much smaller percentage of this country than the theater should be reaching. We have something that is needed by everybody, and it goes to about 5% of the population. So figuring out how we change that, which isn't just a question of uh, you know, mobile units. Mobile units are good things. It's been fantastic for us. But it's also a question of reimagining what the form can do in order to make sure that it matters to more people, in order to make sure that we can actually place it at the center of people's lives. And that's, um, that's fairly general, but... Uh, but I think we all know what that means. We, we don't know exactly how to do it, but w w the biggest thing I want to say is we can't cut our ambitions short. We shouldn't settle for what we have. We should be aggressive and ambitious and not self-satisfied about what we're currently doing. The other thing I want to say is, uh, yes, Israel-Palestine, but just in general, the experience that we just had with Eclipsed was really extraordinary and being able to speak about an issue and reach tens of thousands of people. And again, to say that the theater is a way of bringing home sexual slavery, um, uh, the problems of the civil wars in Africa, the problems of female soldiers. And bring that to a visceral reality. That's something we can do, that there are not many forms that can do that. But in order to do it, we have to say, yeah, we're going to tackle we, we, we need to speak about these issues. We need to tackle them. If the plays aren't there, we have to figure out how to bring them into existence. And again, I just want to argue for our ambition and that how large our ambition should be. And I would simply echo that by saying, um, I, I, I would love as an artistic director to see less plays that use the metaphor of the American family to discuss politics and more about just hitting it straight on with with great skill and structure and allowing political theater to be something that is that you don't have to run away from or cover over. Um. Just to press forward on the Israel-Palestine question, Ari Roth from Mosaic Theater with huge, huge props to both of you. Um, how can this collaboration as it were, between the United Nations and the public theater, help to reconvene conversations about peace in the Middle East, particularly with respect to Israel-Palestine. This conference, this international pre-conference, invited the Freedom Theater of Jenin and the playwright Moti Lerner for a first ever encounter between artists who could have and should have been speaking to each other but because of the real politics in the region, never did for over 15 years. This conference achieved that dialogue thanks to the Lab for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown and its collaboration with TCG. What can the great public theater do in collaboration with the United Nations do to do something that the politicians can't? 
this is uh, the hardest issue that I have faced in my professional lifetime. I have found it more difficult to figure out how to uh, fully address this issue than any other. Um, and it is a issue where, as well you know, Ari, that the, it is one of the few places where the difficulty that the theater has in uh, speaking about and engaging this issue mirrors the difficulty of our society as a, as a whole. And uh, I, you know, that I can, all I know is we, we have to do it. We have to do better. We have to push the boundaries of what is acceptable to talk about. We have to push the boundaries of who gets to talk about it, of who has agency. Um, it's also one of the play, one of the very few issues in which I think New York is the hardest place <laughs> to talk about this. Uh, but we have to do it. Um, I don't. I I have never actually asked Ambassador Power how she can help me. <laughs> <laughs> but now that you've brought it up, <laughs> you don't necessarily have to answer in public. But we okay. we should talk we, about. We should talk about. It. I mean, the I, just to echo what Oscar is saying, and then I want to maybe at least my part, end on a more upbeat note, but you know, the, this issue, the, it's like polarization all the way down, turtles all the way down, you know, it's, it's um, the, within the UN community, it's very hard uh, to create shared spaces other than in the UN Security Council itself, which is such a performative venue um, and such a divisive one fundamentally, you know, everybody coming with the strongest version of their argument for why, you know, nothing on the other side is 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 right. I mean, just it's a non-listening venue by and large. Um, and I mean, culture and art should be the vehicle. On so many of the other issues we've discussed, it has been and it can be a vehicle. But on this, it 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 just the the um, the ways in which uh, strong views on 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 all sides kind of look to see you know, what is the sign of bias on the other side and that that then becomes a disabler. And so it's, it's, to, it's like, how, what is the way to give it a second chance to make, to give any piece of art a second chance to make a first impression if, 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 there, if one is already looking with such suspicion to, you know, to, to, uh, to put it in, 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 a, in a box or in a slot. And, and that is, so Oscar and I will take this uh, and talk about it and then think about is there a way to do that? Um, you know, in an ideal, in order for it to work properly, you know, the way I think about it is, there, you know, the, I think about it as a US government person and I think about it as somebody who gets to interact with diplomats from other countries, including the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli ambassador and to imagine is there anything cultural that we could do together as a starting point and, and it's just, it's, it's, you know, particularly in the current climate, without talks and, and without things progressing, um, it, 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 it's, it's like cult, culture should be the, can and should be the, 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 the Trojan horse, you know, through which you can, you can move the other, but, but absent, you know, progress and movement, you know, toward talks, it, it, you know, it feels, at least in my world, uh, frozen on, on, on lots of other fronts. The, 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 the more upbeat, um, uh, thing I just wanted to add was uh, Oscar mentioned Eclipsed and we of the 193 countries who um, are represented at the UN there are uh, 36 women ambassadors so 36 out of 193 that's a little strange in 2016 <laughs> but it is it is what it is um, when Eclipsed was uh, off-Broadway at the public, um, we invited the 36 women ambassadors, again, through working with Rosalind and Oscar, to attend Eclipsed. And one of the women ambassadors who was there, who's now the foreign minister, was the Liberian ambassador to the UN. And she said after the show, I you know, it's again this privilege that I have of, of um, sitting and watching the play, but also watching my colleagues watch the play and watching her watch the play. And she said, you know, this is my life this is what I've lived. I knew it was happening in my country, but because I didn't experience it myself, I don't think I've ever really understood what my country went through before I saw this play. Um, and she's now the current Liberian foreign minister. So that's the power of art. You know, you can hear about it as an abstraction, but living the experiences of those women up close and personal, she, she said it's the first time she understood sexual violence in Liberia. 
and all that now she had a responsibility to go and do as somebody who was just promoted to become the minister, um, you know, grows out of the emotion, the heft of that uh, piercing. So there, Ambassador. Yeah. So there, Ambassador, was the straight line we were talking about at the very beginning. Um, thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Oscar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, TCG, for inviting us and having a bloody brilliant conference. Everybody's all at Twitter now. 862 references to Hamilton. <laughs> now, I want to thank Kwame, Oscar, and Ambassador Power. You know, that, their talk so beautifully uh, reflected so many of the strands of thought that have been flowing through this conference. And um, I think it's really just, man, given us a lot to think about and talk about going forward. Here we are. We're in our last moments now. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes right now to, uh, to, to give some thanks to people here in the room. Um, and I really want to start out by recognizing the volunteers who have been helping us throughout. <laughs> throughout these days. And I just want to ask um, volunteers, if you are able, could you stand? And if not, can you raise your hand? Thank you, thank you. Um, now I want to ask our host committee to please stand and be recognized. These people are like honorary TCG staff. Uh, speaking of TCG staff, uh, I know uh, you might all be staff. Are you out there? You're probably like, they're probably asleep and they're, no. How could they be asleep after that last panel? Um, if you were able to stand, please do. Um, we'd really like to give you all a huge, huge round of applause. And I just, I just want to say, um, because of their deep commitment to teamwork and shared leadership, they would never give themselves this credit, but I really must recognize Devin Berkshire and Gus Schulenberg in particular for their incredible leadership. There's another TCG staffer who I'd like to ask to stand again. Um, it's Amelia Cacciaparo. Um, please, please let me explain. Um, it's Amelia's 25th work anniversary at TCG. And we, we really believe that attention must be paid. Um, Amelia, can you please come up here and join me on stage? <laughs> talking a lot about how our impact in people's lives um, ripple out and touch people we don't know. And we may not know, so watching part of John O'Donnell. Also listen to Nicole Saul feeling when not always and just motion. Grant equity. 
So this is what we're going to do way to think of a very no touched by on three. When I say the pet. All right. So we are at the end of our time together, about to run off to our trains and planes and automobiles. But I do want to share just a few that day, Thursday, that was really just feels like about two months ago, <laughs> of how Anna Devere Smith rattled the ground on which we stand and urged us to move if we are moved. I'm thinking about John Maida and his call for creative leadership, daring enough to jump off hills. I'm thinking about Stephen Karam and Nicole Salter holding us a accountable to telling the truth. And I'm thinking about Samantha Power and her advocacy of the power of theater and her constant reminder to live our lives forward. I'm thinking of a flood of moments in breakout sessions in affinity groups on the hill and at the bar where a moment of connection happened and something new became possible. But above all, I'm thinking about the sounds of those kids laughing in the halls, the contagious energy of the teens who were here in attendance, the voices of young refugees telling their stories, the exchanges between LORT leaders and local students, and the reports of an intergenerational leaders of color meeting so big it kept running out of chairs. Yes. <laughs> you know what? Yes. They're the voices of our legacy leaders who are here, the voices of those who are not, the voices of the indigenous peoples on whose ground we stand. I think of all these people communicating in English and Spanish and Korean and ASL across borders of conflict, across borders of time, and I think if there is a theater nation, these are its sacred documents, its constitution and bill of rights, written not in moldy documents but in living bodies, bodies moving, jumping, truth-telling, connecting, laughing, weeping, singing, and signing a declaration of interdependence carried in bodies from one generation to the next, bruised but unbroken. We leave each other now, but the work continues, and before we know it, it'll be June 2017, and we'll gather together again in Portland, Oregon, to reconnect with our theater nation, our theater family. <laughs> There it is. Thank you for being here. See you at the party and see you next year.